So let's talk about becoming famous, which is what a lot of young people want to know. It's, and, and, and it's an interesting question. How do people become famous? Now, it's easy to find surface explanations for specific cases, right? We could say, oh, this actor became famous after this breakthrough role, or uh, this singer became famous after this hit song. But developing general explanations of how to become famous we, requires us to have some sense of like the underlying mechanism and, uh, 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 and, and a sense of what fame is. Uh, you know, beyond renown, but like how it works, where does human attention draw generically? Now, the literature offers a lot of explanations as to why people acquire fame. And each of them sensitizes us to a factor and suggests practical ideas of how a podcaster could acquire fame, but they all have their limits. So I, I want to go through five, uh, five, uh, prevalent explanations in literature, and then talk about the enterprise management view that came through in uh, uh, my work with Ryan, and is the uh, it's the uh, the take that we're I think we're approaching with. The first explanation of fame is probably the most common, and it's that famous people become famous for doing impressive things or for being special or outstanding. So, you know. Uh, John Sullenberger, Sully was famous for landing a plane in the Hudson River and saving everybody's life. Now, you know, that's a, that's, that's a pretty great accomplishment. Uh, and so he's famous. Or Wayne Gretzky was a great hockey player. Or Jeff Bezos made a lot of money. And these types of dynamics can occur at lower levels of aggregation too, right? Like local celebrities who are stars in the local music scene or you know, the anchor for local TV or the captain of the football team. My daughters uh, know the teenager who won the local singing contest. And I remember they uh, asked me to, you know, walk up and introduce myself as if they were real celebrities. To my daughters, they were celebrities. Um, let's just think about this. Okay, I'll get back to that. Now, the idea that Fame is acquired by achievement, suggests that to become famous, you got to do something great. You got to attain excellence in some field. And, and, and that is often how people rise to fame. That's, you know, we know of Michael Phelps because he won the gold medals. You know, we know of J.K. Rawlings either because we like the story, we know she sold billions of dollars of books. Um, usually, the, the, the main issue with this explanation is that achievement can exist in the eye of the beholder. Like, for example, Charles Manson is very famous. You know, Ted Bundy is famous. There's a whole genre of culture that celebrates mass murderers. And I guess you could say, well, he killed a lot of people. That's an accomplishment in the field of murder. But like, it also speaks to the fact that you can construe anything as an achievement or an impressive feat, you know, including antisocial things or even trivial things. And so it's hard to use achievement as a basis for explaining how fame works in general. Because you can always find something to be like, oh, they're great at that. Oh, they're great at facial expressions. You know. The second view emphasizes status and sees our relationship intertwined with our social position. So for non-sociologists, uh, the, the concept of status, as I use it here, talks about people's natural proclivity to... Uh, fall into pecking orders or, or deferential behavior. Whenever you have a, a sufficiently large group of people, it's sort of, a, it, it's an observed behavior of people that they will organize in authority structures, informal ones. Everybody will start, somebody will become the boss and everybody will start listening to the boss. Or two or three people will be loud and dominant and then everybody's going to listen to them. All right. Now that's an informal status hierarchy and it develops naturally. And then we have formal ones, like who becomes the president of the, 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 the country or the school. Now the implication here is that you can acquire fame by securing a position of power uh, or status in a community and use that as a basis to acquire fame. So for example, we listen to Frank Wu. He's the president of our college. He's famous in our college. He's important in our college. It makes sense that we would pay attention to what he says because he's the boss. You know, he has a high status in the social system that we're embedded in. And so we pay attention to him just as we pay attention to whoever the president is now. Now, when there's turnover and somebody loses that status, often we do stop paying attention to him. We stop paying attention to the past presidents of our country or of our school, right? 
we don't listen, we, we might not pay attention to uh, people who are in former positions. Now there's merit to this view. Fame can accrue to high status people, that much we know. When somebody becomes a CEO or a big shot, we do pay attention to them. And fame can confer status, like we might respect somebody or defer to them because we know they're famous or popular. But it is not necessarily a great explanation, or it doesn't give us a great guide for how somebody low status can acquire fame. And we know that happens, right? We know it happens all the time. Most people who are famous did not walk into that position. It was built. And so how? So that's the limit of it. It's interesting. It sensitizes us to the idea that fame relationships can be in a status hierarchy, but it does uh, not give us a lot of explanation as to how. Hype is a third path to fame. The uh, idea with hype is that uh, you spread information about somebody, tell everybody about something, either through advertisements or public relations, publicity. Uh, the limit of this is hype promotion can be an important part of a strategy to acquire fame, but there are many instances in which somebody is hyped and audiences don't take to the person. So, uh, and the person's celebrity doesn't exist beyond the hype, beyond somebody paying for their exposure. So hype can generate exposures, but it can't guarantee that someone will attach or engage with a person and become a celebrity, follow them. The fourth is charisma. Uh, it's rooted in the Greek words for charm and beauty. And what this is, this is like the Max Weber concession, hold on, conception of, uh, you know, uh, having a, 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 an indefinable an draw, an indefinable uh, uh, allure. Uh, charisma can involve appearances, you know, like John Hamm is a very, very handsome man, but it's more than that. A lot of charismatic people are able to transmit a magnetic quality. A charisma is like a, something that draws people to them. And it can be in their character. It can be in their manner, their way of speaking. It doesn't have to be in their appearance. Now, there's a lot of research on what makes somebody charismatic in the field of leadership studies. And there's a general agreement that the literature hasn't really gone far past laundry lists of things like, you know, aggressive, attractive, intelligent, and so on. There's no, the, the literature that I've seen hasn't developed like a real uh, defined sense of what charisma is, how it's generated, how it affects people, but rather it's treated like a residual category. Oh, this person's loved, therefore they have charisma. Now let's find out what the essence of that charisma is. So sometimes it's not a meaningful guide. The last one is an interest, or the, the last one in the literature is an interesting one. And it's the view of celebrities as a symbol. And it comes from Jeff Alexander. And the idea here is that celebrities or famous people we use as stand-ins to uh, represent institutions or organizations or ideals or movements or communities. So for example, the idea would be like when we celebrate Marx, we're not actually celebrating Marx. Uh, we might be celebrating, uh, you know, socialist ideals or anti-capitalist sentiment, or we might, you know, identify with intellectualism. You know, there is the celebrities, the people we follow as celebrities, they, they, they might be sort of uh, personifications of abstract things. And we interact with the people as if, as if they're who we're communing with, but we're using them as a means of affirming our fidelity or you know, our, our adherence to an identity or an ideal or something like that. Um, and then finally, this is the view that is coming through in our research, I think. And Ryan, maybe you'll disagree with me. Uh, uh, Ryan's looked at the empirical work. He's not really working on this paper. He's working on something else. But I find that when we talk to the micro celebrities, uh, they look to us like person-centered mass communications enterprises. By a mass communications enterprise, I mean it's like a project or an organization that's focused on disseminating content or information. 
it's person centered. So the enterprise is branded by an individual identity as opposed to an abstract one. So instead of Vox Media, it says Recline, right? Instead of, you know, uh, Happy Madison Productions, it's Adam Sandler. Um, there is often for larger celebrities and smaller ones, there's often multiple people who are working to create that single image it's a full enterprise like for jennifer lopez for example she has a uh, she has tons of employees all of whom play a role in creating jennifer lopez as we recognize her in popular culture there's publicists personal trainers assistants and they're working on things like physical appearance or her performance and things like that that's a whole team that's an organization like if you look at the flow of work and the people involved it looks like an organization uh, and so one way that I've come to see celebrity is it's like a person branded enterprise. And I get this sense, you can get this sense when you talk to people in a lot of ways. One is when we talk to respondents, there's a detachment from fame. It's not something like you expect to be, oh, I love fame, but usually they have sort of a cynical view of it. They're like, yeah, it's part of the job. We need followers. But I, uh, my sense was, I, is that I didn't really, I don't recall meeting respondents who were like, oh, I love fame. I love the love that I get. They express a, an appreciation for being followed, an appreciation for people who consume their products and a desire to serve them and, and satisfy them as, as any business would, its customer base. But the personal attachment at least struck me as not being there. We talked about how there's multiple people involved and that happens even with micro celebrities you know they have subcontractors working on aspects of their communication like a website you know or or their social media so we've been in organizations that hire writers we've uh, there's one that i can think of that hired writers so what came out of the person's mouth wasn't their own speech they hired somebody fame is generally not a means but or it's often a means but not an end I think that's self-explanatory. And more importantly, when we look at how fame is built, it looks a lot like a business. Uh, you know, they have a target market in mind. They're aware of where they are. They try to create products that satisfy them, build a fidelity, a, a loyal following. And they're always trying to sell and promote their franchise to audiences. So the way that the micro celebrities that we've observed strike me is they, they look like entrepreneurs and they seem to talk about their work as if they were entrepreneurs, even when they're the product, like there's some separation. Um, Ryan, do you have anything to say? You want to disagree or anything like that? Or uh, No, I, I think, you know, I, I, we've talked about this. I agree with a lot of what you're saying, of course. And I think the one other thing I would add, I think maybe you're going to get to this, I don't know, is that the, the technology, you know, what's different about the celebrity today is that a lot of the people we spoke to, they were kind of cultivating relationships with their communities, right? Yeah. Which is very different than movie stars of the past that were just on the silver screen and you had no contact with. These celebrities were able to uh, communicate directly with them, you know, have, have them as Patreons supporting them. Uh, it's a very more kind of relational uh, experience as a celebrity. And I think that that's partly why they didn't want to be grand celebrities for the whole world. They really just wanted status within their uh, communities there. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Oh, because that's what I totally thought you were going to get to it. Too. Yeah, I totally, to totally. <laughs> it's good. All right. Let's talk about uses of fame. I'm going to be really quick because I realize I'm running out of time and I want to have a lot of time for discussion. How do people use fame? Um, there are four types of discussions about how fame is deployed that we've come across or that have come up in our discussions. Um, the first are psychic rewards. So I, I think a lot of a aspiring celebrities uh, think about uh, the, as they're young people, they think about esteem, impressing their friends, getting the love of strangers, feeling wanted and things like that. And the micro celebrities who we interview, they, they appreciate, they do feel esteem. They are flattered that people follow them. They are very grateful. But like I said, it, that 
I don't know. It, 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 it's, it feels very much like they are, that the investment is lower than you might expect. Uh, they do enjoy fame if it's part of an activity that they enjoy or that's a creative outlet. Uh, and for some people, fame can be a mixed blessing. I had a discussion. First of all, I'm going to talk about it. Uh, earlier this week, I did a podcast with Carrie Ferris, who's one of sociology's leading sociologists of fame. And she said in her work, you know, a lot of female news anchors, for example, they get harassed. They don't like it. They have people come up to them at dinner, you know, when they're at a restaurant to interrupt. And it's unpleasant or it makes you feel unsafe. And so renown can be a mixed blessing. And for some people, it's just like it's a fact of life that they have to deal with, given the type of work they do. They're in a communication centric line of work. And this is like the price you have to pay. It's not unlike, for example, what a professor might feel like if somebody interrupts their dinner you know, in the cafeteria while they're having friends, if they were to get a steady stream of that. You're grateful, you're accessible, you know, but it can be too much. There, uh, there are instances where it can be too much and even threatening. The second reason is money. And my sense is that fame is not easy to monetize. Monetize is the word that they use, converting fame into money. And it's really quite difficult. And even people who are uh, quite famous, they, generally they've reported you know, modest, modest incomes. A lot of them have, a lot of people who I thought were quite famous had day jobs um, or they had other sources of income. Fame in and of itself, even when you're well-known, uh, might not uh, lend itself to making much money unless you're extremely famous. And often it's a subordinate uh, motive anyways. Like, we, I, I think there are many creators, they know how they could become more popular. Uh, there are ways that you could easily create uh, an enterprise that is more popular by doing something controversial or taking up topics that are, you know, taboo or whatever. But like people don't want to uh, because fame is often not the main goal. What is valuable to a lot of our respondents is status and group membership. Uh, there are some creators who are a lot like academics. You know how academics, they love sociology. They want to build sociology. They want to meet other sociologists. They want to become respected in the field of sociology. So that those type of dynamics occur in a lot of areas of interest, from comic books to like vacation, theme park, you know, timeshare, whatnot. Like there's all sorts. And We've run into creators who look a lot like professors on, you know, esoteric subjects that don't fit neatly into, uh, into uh, you know, an academic discipline. But they're still very serious about it, and a lot of those dynamics exist. The last thing that celebrity is uh, thought to be useful for is influence. And um, celebrity can give you the power of exposure. It gives you the power to deliver a message to someone. But research into celebrity endorsers shows that it's more complicated than that. Audiences evaluate celebrities as if they were like they do other people in their lives. They evaluate how much they trust a celebrity, how competent they think a celebrity is to comment or make an appraisal of an object that they're speaking about. And they'll listen to them as they would any other person in their life. So, for example, if Tom Hanks says, you know, go get your COVID vaccine, there are people who might reject, you know, not everybody will listen to Tom Hanks, even if they like him. They might say, well, Tom Hanks has different politics from me or Tom Hanks is not a medical professional. So people are thoughtful in how they evaluate uh, uh, how they evaluate uh, the influence of celebrities. Let's see. Uh, all right. Finally, last topic, and then we'll open it up to discussion. It's going to make a good time. Let's take a moment to talk about the death of celebrity and cancellation. Now, George Patton famously said, all glory is fleeting. And it is because fame decays as soon as it's secured. Uh, you will find that, or, or I, I think my sense of our interactions with our respondents and 
my experience in running podcasts is that keeping the attention of somebody, keeping access to people's informational diets is a constant job. You uh, people lose interest in you as soon as they stop getting rewards for following you, for engaging with you. And so staying relevant is a task that somebody is always having to do or else fame will naturally decay. Why does fame decay? There's a lot of views on that. First is it is believed that uh, uh, human attention draws to novelty. And so the first time you see something, you pay attention to it, it's noteworthy. But the more you see something, the less you pay attention to it. And that can work with people as well. Sometimes contextual changes affect the relevance of the field. So Fauci is famous during COVID. At the end of COVID, will as many people be interested in Fauci? Probably not, because the relevance of the field has declined, right? And often when somebody breaks through and becomes famous, it's because the salience of their field is peaking and there's somebody important in it. Like it's sort of at a local maximum of public interest in what they do is when you'll break out. But as soon as you do, it's already declining. New cycles turn, new, you know, new topics come up. And even though audiences might like someone, they become less relevant, they spend less time and they forget. Celebrities can also lose influence or impact in a field like an aging athlete somebody who loses their position. And there's also just interference of new data. So uh, cognitive researchers say that we forget because every new piece of information that we receive uh, interferes with the recall of old stuff. And so just by going through your day and seeing things, it's going to push the per what you watched last night on TV and the person who was featured in it out of your cognition from your, you know, the forefront of your mind to the deep recesses of your memory. Now, how can you slow the fade? How can people stay relevant? Well, often people try to refresh their fame by doing something new or different. But if you're not doing something new and if you're not moving to a new field, then uh, one way that the fade can be slowed is by something that Candy and colleagues uh, uh, call uh, 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 cultural encoding. So, what happens is there are Two, uh, two stages in a, per, a, a celebrity's descent into obscurity. There is first the fall from active engagement. So right now we actively engage with Fauci because he's an important figure in government and has expertise on an important issue that is concerning us now. And so we will pay attention to Fauci now. That's active engagement. As COVID becomes less relevant, politically or to you personally, you're just going to stop paying attention. And that's the first fall. But you will still remember Fauci. There'll still be talk of Fauci. You'll watch, you know, CNN's uh, Remember COVID special, and it'll have Fauci in it. But over time, everything related to Fauci falls from memory. The people who remember Fauci die off, and people fall into obscurity, unless you have like an institution that's constantly bringing you back. You know, like the like the church brings back Jesus, right? Or like you know, uh, the federal government brings back memories of all of our old presidents. So one way to culturally encode what happens is while you're popular, if you can be inserted into other pieces of information or cultural objects, then those objects' persistence might carry you uh might might keep your celebrity alive for a little longer so for example uh john sullenberger landed the plane in the hudson and and he was very very famous for a few weeks a few news cycles but then tom hanks made a movie about him he encoded the story of sullenberger into a hollywood film and that pulls out sullenberger's notability for several more years right we don't forget about them in part because there's a movie that movie's in on a Netflix catalog. Some, you know, it's available, uh, you know, in a, in a, at a rental. Well, there's no more rental stores, but you can buy it on iTunes or whatever. So the existence of the movie encodes Sullenberger's presence in the culture. And the more somebody's encoded, the more stuff that's made about them, the longer they stay. But eventually everybody gets forgotten. One thing that, uh, 
we found in 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 our work also is uh, that that isn't mentioned in in the um, in the literature, but something that I, I've thought about is high involvement followers. Now, there are certain members of your audience who can develop a very very deep bond with a franchise, and I would say a lot of our pod- podcasters are very, very aware of them. They call them like my core audience or, you know, my my fans or things like that. But what they are talking about are, they are talking about audience members who have a high degree of interest and attachment to the person. They follow them, they interact with them, whatever. Those people are can act in the same way that cultural encoding does. They will stick around with a franchise longer. They will try new things that the franchise offers. And sometimes they'll even create derivative content, right? Like if if I like your show and I tweet about it, uh, or I tweet about every episode, then like I'm encoding your content on my Twitter feed. I'm reminding people. And in a sense, I'm working as a cultural encoding agent for you. And high involvement audiences are very, very important to a lot of producers they talk about them they cater to them they're at the forefront of their mind um this is a well whatever i'll get it and then one last one last thing uh the topic of cancellation uh 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 uh, comes up once in a while and cancellation is interesting um so what cancellation is it's it uh it is it's often a uh, it's a social movement that is trying to encourage people to stop following or boycotting content that features a particular celebrity who is perceived to have transgressed a you know uh, some type of moral uh, red line, right? So, uh, for example, uh, so if you take a look on on the left, these are con- conservative people who, uh, you know, in in conservative circles are said to have been canceled for their uh, opposition to liberal views. And on the right, there's uh, a cartoon about the 1619 Project and a question about critical race theory becoming banned. These are two examples of cancellation where somebody is engaged in some method to try to prevent people from consuming products, trying to get people's shows delisted, trying to decode them from the cultural memory. Get try to get Aziz and Sari's shows off in Netflix. Unfollow his whatever you know. Um, a lot of this is a political discourse. Uh, a lot of people who are being canceled appear to be using it as part of a campaign to hype a new cultural or a new production outlet. And uh, I don't know. It's hard to differentiate the act of being canceled from like the act of hyping a new enterprise because it's a great line to do it. True cancellation, though, is far more difficult today than in the past. It used to be that you could blackball somebody, but now that makes no sense. Uh, I mean, in a world where Nazis can run TV and radio stations, uh, because they can, effectively on YouTube or by running a podcast or running a blog, anybody can run anything. Uh, There's far less regulation than there ever was. And I, I I just don't believe in this cancellation but what it is interesting is it shows that they're attacking the basis the economic basis or the influence base of a person by encouraging people to unfollow them and decode them from the culture so that is the end of sort of our look at fame how do you get it how do you use it how do you keep it if you enjoyed this talk check out an episode from this Monday of my podcast, the Annex Sociology Podcast. It features Carrie O'Ferris, and we talk about celebrity. She's a very accomplished researcher and an expert. She's a very funny woman. Uh, You can get it on iTunes or Spotify, or you can just ask your smart speaker to play the latest episode of the Annex Sociology Podcast. If you do this this week or next week, you'll get that episode. And then one more uh, sort of message before we go to q and a this is just for the queen's podcast lab series uh thank you for joining us on the queen's podcast lab uh learning series these are free educational products or uh, resources rather brought to you by the state and city of new york these are your tax dollars at work 
we create free public resources and non-commercial scholarly media content. And if you'd like to support the work we do, uh, visit our website, queenspodcastlab.com and click donate your tax deductible donation to our project through the uh, Department of Sociology will not only help us, but students.